Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Ali DePew and I'm with Inspired Classroom and I am honored to introduce Dr. Mirdad Kia, who is here to speak with us today. Um, just a little bit of history and background on Dr. Kia. He grew up in the Iranian capital of Tehran and around about 17, is that correct? Yes, you I came to the United States where you attended um, Wisconsin Madison. Yes. Yes, and during that time he, he actually got your doctoral degree degree in Eastern Middle Eastern and North African studies. Um, after that you became a teacher. Yes. Well, that's correct. <laughs> starting starting at, at Wisconsin Madison, followed by Cornell, and then at the University of Montana where you are currently teaching today. Yes. Um, Dr. Kia is highly published and he has also won some very prestigious uh, top University of Montana teaching awards, including the Distinguished Teacher of the Year, uh, the Most Inspirational Teacher of the Year, and in 2000 he was named Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kia. Um, please remember to keep your, your microphones muted um, when you're not speaking. This is interactive and we encourage lots and lots of participation. So, thank, thank you very you. much, Annie. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Uh, Chinook, hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, Darby, hello. <laughs> Good afternoon to you, to all of you. Thank you for being here. And Eureka, thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon to all of you. And thank you, your teachers, for showing the interest in uh, this program, which is wonderful. I want to thank Ali and uh, Montana World Affairs Council for organizing this. This is wonderful. It connects our university in Missoula with all you guys and I hope that after you're finished with your school you choose University of Montana in Missoula as your destination and we would love to have all of you in our classes. So please consider UM Missoula as your next destination after you're finished. I have been asked to just talk for a few minutes about my field, about some of the things we teach and then we will open it to all of you to ask any questions you have and please do not hesitate to ask any questions you have about what I will discuss and I will be happy to answer them if I have an answer. Uh, so as Ali mentioned I teach uh, that whole region of the world uh, which is sort of Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, sometimes uh, these days they refer to it as part of the larger Islamic world and uh, as you all know when we talk about Islam or the Islamic world a lot of images conjure up in uh, everybody's mind. Uh, one of the images that conjures up is usually this vast desert, right? With a lot of camels and a lot of oil of course and uh, you know I was in a, in a school uh, uh, it was actually a much younger uh, group than you are and I always ask to uh, you know talk about the so-called thing Islam or Islamic world and this time I decided to actually ask the class what images comes to their minds when uh, they think about this world, this world that we call the Islamic world. And of course uh, these, these guys were a bit younger, shy and so on and so forth so they didn't want to say anything to not sound, you know, rude or maybe uh, foolish. So I kept on encouraging, please tell me what comes to your mind. And after a few minutes of encouraging, cajoling, somebody raised his hand and he said, well, desert, you know. And I said, okay, we put desert on the board. And we put the desert on the board and then a few more minutes of sort of encouraging people to say what else comes to their mind, of course, that animal which always comes with some deserts, camels, right? So we put camels and then uh, and, you know, a few more minutes, what else comes to mind? And they said oil. And at that point I reminded them we are talking about a world which is about 1.3 to 4 billion people. 1.3 to 4 billion, not million, but billion people. Any individual comes to mind, any scientist, any artist, any writer, any poet, anyone with any interest in this. And of course there was total silence in the class and finally somebody raised uh, his hand in the back of the class and he said, those towel heads running around in the desert. 
And so, and so here is uh, our image of that part of the world. Uh, vast desert, lot of camels, lot of oil, and lot of towel heads causing trouble uh, for the United States and the rest of the world. So what do they do? They get up, they have breakfast, they hijack a few planes, right? And then they go and take a lunch break. Then they go on the streets. They burn U.S. flags and they are shouting something incomprehensive. Nobody knows what they are saying. All we know that they look mean. They are mostly bearded. Not an insult to the beautiful beard of your teacher, Eureka. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, you know, beard and towel and uh, and then after an evening break, they go and throw rocks and. Uh, you know, grenades at each other. Uh, so uh, while we are uh, very rational, we are very humane, we are very democratic, we are very respectful of everybody's rights, especially women's rights, they are uh, very disrespectful, they are fanatical, they are irrational, and of course very, very, uh, uh, very biased when it comes to human rights and women's rights. I mean, look at how they treat women in Afghanistan and other Islamic countries. These are the images I have to deal with every time I teach a class on the Islamic world. And the first thing I always start with is not to say there are no deserts or there are no camels and there are no troublemakers in that part of the world, but to say that's part of the story, but there is a much longer and bigger story and picture that we have to look at. First and foremost, I thought, and it's going to be, I'm going to act a little bit like a, a weatherman, I guess, <laughs> to give you a map. First of all, I think in order to understand this part of the world, and I will ask you questions, and uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have, as I mentioned, about this map. But this map is not so much to sort of cover the background, but to tell you one thing, and this is the ABC of understanding this part of the world is this map that you see, uh, the majority of the countries you see behind me are artificial, which means what? Which means that the people uh, who live in majority of these countries, not all of them, but majority of them were not the people who decided that this will be the name of their country, this will be the borders of their country, this is how they will be called, whether they are called Syrians, or Iraqi, or Jordanian, or whatever you call them, but that this map was made for the people of this region by somebody else. And that somebody else did this map, or designed this map, most of it in second half of the 19th century, and some of it in the first two decades of the 20th century, from 1900 to 19. 20, 25, and these were mostly the British and the French who actually designed this map. Iraq, in the shape that it exists now, did not exist. Syria did not exist. Jordan did not exist. Lebanon did not exist. Saudi Arabia did not exist. There were no people who called themselves, we are Iraqis, we are Syrians, we are Jordanians, we are Lebanese. All these countries, even their names, even their flags, even their governments were created by people who occupied this region during and after the First World War. And these two powers were the British and the French. And when people ask, remember after 9-11, you know, the big question when we were hit by this savage terrorist attack which hit New York and brought down the towers which hit the, uh, our capital, Washington, D.C., and was an attack on uh, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, people kept on asking me, why do they hate us? Why do they hate us? First of all, I think the question should be a little bit different. Who are they? Not everybody in that region hates us, first of all. But there are some people who hate us, and when they talk to them directly, one of the things they say is that we live in countries which we had no uh, uh, power to make them and to decide about them. You made us, and by you they always refer to the West in general, the French, the British, and so on and so forth. 
You created this reality, and we now live in a reality created by you for us. This is the biggest point of resentment when you, uh, you run to some of these people who are radical and who do not like United States. This is one of the most important things. And the second thing that we have to remember, and this is also very important, we always think about countries in terms of nations, right? When we think about, let's say, Germany, we think about people who speak German, who identify themselves as Germans. They have basically a German history and culture of their own. We think about France. We think about Sweden. We think about Spain or Portugal. We think about people with a certain language, certain ethnic background, certain uh, cultural and historical background. The problem with the countries that were created here by the British and the French, they all contain many different groups. I want to ask uh, all of you, and if you can uh, raise your hands, I would appreciate it. Can somebody tell me who lives in a country called Iraq? What are the groups who live in Iraq today? Eureka, Eureka, you tried to raise your hand, so raise your hand if you have the answer. Okay. <laughs> You're on. Syria. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, uh, in Iraq, we have a people called the Kurds, right? K U R D S. And, you know, until uh, 15 years ago, whenever I talked about Kurds, uh, they all thought I was talking about a form of Wisconsin cheese. Uh, so, Kurds, you know, who are they? Nobody knew who the Kurds are. Now they know that they're not cheesehead Green Bay Packers fans, but they are actually an ethnic group very different from the rest. In the middle of the country, there are people we call Arabs, uh, and they are Orthodox Muslims. And in the south, there are people called Shia, who belong to a different sect in Islam. What I am trying to say is that Iraq, this small Iraq, contains so many different groups, uh, language groups, religious groups, ethnic groups. So these countries were not created for one people. They actually pushed a lot of different people to live in these countries by force. So the Kurds in the north they did not want to live with the Arabs in the south, but they were told by the British, you have no other alternative but to live together. And so if today we see the Kurds, because U.S. troops are there, they have more freedom, they are demanding a Kurdish state, a state for themselves, for the Kurds. That's why they are demanding that, because they do not want to be part of this country called Iraq, and what the region is going through now, as we speak to you, is some of the people who have been forced to live in these countries are trying to get out of these countries. These are not countries for them. These are more like prisons for them. So that's one of the things that is very important. Another issue that I want to share with you before we open it up for your questions is that typically when we talk about this area, this region, even when we talk about this religion called Islam, everybody says, oh, they are Arabs, right? The word Arab and the word Islam always come as equivalent to one another. And the fact of the matter is, the Islamic world, people who follow this religion called Islam, there are about 1.4 billion people who follow this religion called Islam. And out of this uh, 1.4 billion, there are only... Uh, 300 million or so who are Arabs. The rest of them are not Arabs, which raises the issue, who are the Arabs and how do you define an Arab and how do you define a follower of Islam who is called a Muslim or a Muslim? And of course, the way you define an Arab is not because of his or her religion. An Arab is a person who speaks Arabic. That's how you define an Arab person. So a Syrian, an Iraqi, a Jordanian, a, a, a Lebanese, a Saudi, they're Arabs. Why? Not because they look like this or they have a, a turban or uh, they are followers of Islam, but because they speak Arabic. 
And among the Arabs, you have to understand that there are about 14 million, one four, 14 million Christians who go to church every Sunday. So not all Arabs are followers of Islam. And for that reason, when you look at behind me a country called Turkey, a country called Iran, a country called Israel, these are not Arab countries. Why? Iranians speak Persian. Turks speak Turkish. In Israel, the national language is Hebrew. And you go to the east, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all these countries, they have their own languages. They're not Arab. So to put everybody in the same bag and call everybody an Arab is actually very misleading and it does not help us to understand the situation. Lastly, and I want to uh, say this very, uh, I think it's, it's an important situation. We have, we meaning United States, has inherited the problems that the British, the French, the Italians, the Russians to some degree left behind. And we are dealing with a very, very complex region. I think one of the areas that um, has been criticized and we need to work on is the American media. I was just uh, leaving home and the CNN was on and of course it was very interesting because they were showing, they had a reporter in Iran. And CNN is showing what? They're showing some shots and they're showing a few guys with beard again, a uh, few women with veil and they're all shouting death to America, death to America. And of course the average American, the average citizen of this great country who watches this, they say, oh, all Iranians, all 75 million of them are all anti-American, they're all either veiled or they're uh, wearing beard and uh, uh, throwing their fist and having these slogans. I thought I'd share with you some of the slides from Iran, first of all, and tell you something about uh, where I am very comfortable. This is, by the way, northern Iran. Does everybody see it? Raise your hands if you see it. Do you guys see the slide behind me? Great. Uh, this is actually next to the Caspian Sea. As you see, uh, this is uh, not a vast desert with a lot of camels. Camels would not survive here, by the way. Uh, it's too cold and it's sometimes very Mediterranean, so on and so forth. This is the area where I studied quite a bit. I did a lot of research personally. And uh, it gives you a sense of the geography, it's quite uh, lush and forested. And one of the reasons I'm saying this is typically the US media, this is the Caspian Sea, it's one of the best places not only for swimming in the Middle East, but also uh, for uh, fishing. Uh, you can put your boat in the sea and, and, and by the way, Caspian Sea, when I say it, uh, it's actually not a sea. It's a lake, it's the largest lake in the world, but it's so large that they call it a sea, uh, the Caspian Sea. And then I wanted to kind of share with you, uh, you know, these are uh, some personal and some of them I've taken off the, uh, uh, the internet, but I wanted to also tell you something. Uh, Iran is always known for uh, shipping and selling oil and so on and so forth. Actually, one of the biggest exports of Iran is this thing called Caviar. Uh, how many people have had caviar? Can you raise your hands? <laughs> caviar. Let me show you a picture of, oh good, Darby has a few people, good. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the fish and the caviar is in the belly of this fish. And let me show you what it looks like. This is the caviar. Uh, when they bring it out, they clean it up and so on and so forth. This uh, small container of caviar sells for something between 75 to 100 dollars. So it's a huge source of revenue uh, for, for the economy there. And I also wanted to show you, uh, I used to uh, uh, mountains of uh, northern Iran. This is, uh, as you see on the slide, it's uh, Mount Damavan. It's the highest point in the Middle East. It's about 5,678 meters. And uh, it's the best place to ski, uh, one of the best places in the world to ski. And I wanted to show you, you know, the typical women veiled and the typical men bearded. The typical Iranian whom I know are these guys. 
Why? Because the majority of Iranians these days are below 30 years old. 75% of Iranians are below 30 years old. And just like most of you, I'm sure, they like fun, and one of the fun things they do is go skiing outside Tehran. And of course, uh, uh, the, the sort of typical Iranian woman uh, who has a pair of skis, and what she does or what he does is actually use the slopes to get out. Uh, they don't get out on Saturdays and Sundays, they get out on Thursdays and Fridays, which are their holidays. And that's what they do. So uh, what uh, I am uh, showing you here is basically some of the things I spend a lot of time with, and that's the image. Now, CNN keeps on showing these few things, and why is that is because when the American media goes to these countries, these countries are controlled by their governments. The media is controlled by the government. And it's all a setup to show a pro-government crowd, a pro-government demonstration, a pro-government group of people who are shouting the right slogans. I think those of you who someday will study journalism and will study this part of the world, hopefully, will have the courage and will have the interest to actually go and talk to the people, see some of the more beautiful parts of these uh, countries, and will learn something as you travel through this region. Why some of these countries are dangerous, and I wouldn't uh, recommend you going to Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, there are still some of the countries in the region which are extremely hospitable and they are very, very beautiful countries. I would call Turkey a very good country to travel to. I would call Jordan a very, con very beautiful country to travel to. These are countries with a lot of history too. And any American with an American passport can go today and really learn a lot about the region. Let me bring my short introduction to a close and I am more than happy to answer any questions you have and please don't hesitate to, answer, to ask any question you might have. Thank you very much for your patience. Let's go ahead and start with Chinook. Chinook, do you have some questions for Dr. Kia? You're on. Let's not be shy. Let's ask any questions you have. <laughs> Tyler, go ahead. Tyler, yes. <laughs> What's your opinion on the fight between the rebels and the government in Syria? That's a great question. Thank you for that excellent question. Um, the, um, the Syrian situation, Tyler, is very similar to that of neighboring Iraq and to other countries in the region. And one of the issues that we are facing in Syria is that Syria, like those other countries that I mentioned, created by the British or the French, was also created by the French in 1920s. And it contains a lot of different people who do not necessarily like to live together in the same country. Uh, the government of Syria, as you know, or uh, some of you know, is run by a group called Alawites or Alawis. Uh, this is a very small group, about 12 to 15 percent. So the person who is running the country today, President Assad, himself comes from this group, this Alawi or Alawite group. And they are very unpopular, and he's very hated by the majority of the Syrians who want not only more freedom, but they want him to go. And therefore, the overwhelming majority of Syrians want President Assad to go and want the country not to be monopolized by this minority group, the Alawites or the Alawis. Uh, so, uh, I am uh, completely, personally, in support of a new government in Syria, without Assad, without dictatorship, without the bloodshed that he has brought to the people of Syria. And I have to tell you what is very sad about Syria. Because Syria has been one of the major centers in history 
of trade, commerce, uh, technology. It has been always a very prosperous part of that region. And now the Assad government, the Assad regime, has turned it into really a, a slaughterhouse, which is tragic to watch. So the sooner he goes, the better. The only problem with that uh, is who is next and what comes if he goes. There is a danger also in him leaving, and that is some of the people who are trying to push him out are as bad, and some people would say worse than he is. And these are uh, the Al-Qaeda people, the very radical religious fanatics uh, armed to their teeth and trying to get rid of Assad and replace it with a strict Islamic regime. So I think the dilemma that um, I have seen in Washington and uh, among the people who make U.S. policy is that while we all want to get rid of Assad, we do not want to replace him with somebody who is as bad or even worse than he is. And look, uh, the problem is compounded by the fact that Syria is a neighbor to several very important countries. Israel is there. I was uh, just uh, a few years ago, I was on the top of the Golan Heights. Syria and Israel, you know, are neighbors. And from the Golan Heights to the capital of Israel, we were driving down the Golan Heights, is about hour 15 minutes, hour and a half, hour 30 minutes. That's how close these countries are. We shouldn't think about Montana, you know, you want to travel the entire state from east to west or from west to east, six, seven, eight hours. Here, in an hour, hour and a half, you are from the border of an enemy state to your capital. That's why the Israelis, that's why the Jordanians, they are crazy about security and they're worried that if he goes and, a, and a, even a worse government replaces him, then you will have even bigger trouble. So, to answer your excellent question in a shorter answer, is there is no easy solution right now. And to find the good people, and there are a lot of good Syrians, but to enable them to come to power, it's a huge challenge, not only for us in the United States, but also for European allies and other countries which want to see a more free and democratic Syria. Questions, Eureka, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, what is your opinion of the conflicts between Israel and other countries in the Middle East? Uh, first of all, great question uh, also. Um, this, is a, this is a very complex issue also. First of all, uh, today, uh, and this is how things uh, change so rapidly, in the region, in the Middle East. Um, I was uh, going to school uh, when I was at your age. I was going to school in Iran. And this is back in 1970s, right? And uh, guess who was the closest ally uh, of Iran at the time when I was going to school? The closest ally of Iran was the state of Israel. Was Israel. Israel, Israel and Iran were the closest allies. They were more like brothers. And uh, in my class, uh, I was sitting in a similar class like you, right around me, there were three or four very dear Israeli friends, right? They were, their parents were working in Iran. There are a lot of Iranians going to Israel, a lot of Israelis coming to Iran. And you know, the history of the two people the Iranians, or shall we call them as they call themselves, Persians, and the Israelis, the Jewish people, is very close. Uh, if you read the Old Testament very carefully, there is only one uh, uh, Gentile, one non-Jewish person who is celebrated as the hero of Jewish history. And that is a man called Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. And he's a Persian King, he's a Persian emperor. You know why he's mentioned in Old Testament? Is because he liberated the Jews from captivity in Babylon and he allowed them to return to the Holy Lands, to Jerusalem, and rebuild their temple, which had been destroyed. 
So the relationship between Iranians and uh, Israelis, it goes back to 2,500 years ago. And uh, Cyrus is mentioned as the Lord's Messiah, as an anointed one. That's how close these two peoples were. And until the 1979 revolution, Persians and, and Israelis were very close diplomatically, economically. Now, with this new regime in power, the relationship has gone south. It's really a bad relationship. And Iran had a president, Ahmadinejad, you remember, the guy who constantly shouted and said abusive things. He was calling for destruction of the state of Israel. So things can change at all times in the Middle East, depending who is in power. But you ask an average Iranian, you are asking an average Israeli, what do you want to see between two countries? Not 1% of Israelis or Iranians want war. They want peace. They want uh, the reestablishment of peaceful ties between the two countries. But the leadership is another story. So going back, now Iran is a non-Arab country, but going back to Arab countries, Arab countries have a very problematic relationship with the state of Israel. And the excuse there is that Israel is in occupation of Palestinian lands. Palestinians are a group of Arabs. They are both Muslims and Christians. Uh, I would not take this very seriously because I think a lot of Arab governments manipulate this. Uh, to their advantage. They could care less about the Palestinians. But to be very fair to the Palestinians and Israelis, they are two very ancient people. They should be both respected. And there should be two states. One a Jewish state called Israel, and one a Palestinian state, an Arab-Palestinian state. And I hope that this will become a reality. But a lot of people are pessimistic. I think if we can address the issue of Palestinians getting a homeland, getting a country, getting recognition, and Israel feeling secure within its own boundaries, then we have taken a major step. Some Arab countries have peace with Israel. Jordan has peace with Israel. Egypt has peace with Israel. Some Arab countries refuse to have peace with Israel. And that's, for example, the Assad government in Syria. So again, it's a complex relationship. We cannot say, all Arab countries uh, hate Israel, or all Arab countries love Israel. There is this kind of love and hate relationship, and from one country to the next, you see a different situation. But thank you for your great question. So I'm going to come to uh, Darby. Darby, how are you guys doing? <laughs> Questions for me? Okay. Do you think the United States should use surveillance techniques against the Muslims to protect ourselves from terrorist attacks? Uh, can you uh, repeat that question? I'm sorry, the, the volume was a little bit down. Yeah. Go Do ahead. you think the United States? <laughs> Do you think the United States should use surveillance techniques against the Muslims to protect ourselves from terrorist attacks? Yeah. Very good question too. I'm very impressed, I have to tell you, by these questions. These are excellent questions. So I think uh, for the security of the United States, we have to do everything possible to make sure that uh, the terrorist attacks of uh, September 2001 will never be repeated, will not be repeated. Uh, I do think, however, that we have to understand where the problems are and apply this technology selectively to areas where the threat is coming from. And it's, it's, uh, it's exactly like the, the issue of surveillance that we have come to sort of see in the last several months uh, with Mr. Snowden, you know, releasing all these documents and then fleeing to Russia. Uh, do we want to listen to the phone calls of an ally leader like a German chancellor, or do we want to look for terrorists? I think we have to be, I think everybody agrees now, we have to be very focused and selective on areas that have caused problems. And if you ask me which countries or which regions we have to be very careful with, 
And let me warn you ahead of time in answering your question that one of the areas we have to be very cognizant of, very aware of, is that the majority of problems that we are facing in the Islamic world actually comes from countries which we consider our allies, not our enemies. So the last time I checked, for example, you know, Turkey, uh, uh, Iran, you know, these guys are not exporting terrorists to the United States, although some of the relationship has become problematic in recent years. But Pakistan is a region, is a country, especially northwestern Pakistan on the border with Afghanistan. That's where the remnants of Al-Qaeda, that's where the remnants of uh, Taliban are operating, and a very, very strong operation. And they can wreak havoc, not only uh, with regard to us, but also the countries in the region. I mean, just look at what Taliban and Al-Qaeda have done to Pakistan itself. The number of people they have killed, they have terrorized, they have blown, uh, they have blown up cars and so on and so forth. Another country to watch very carefully is Yemen in southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. I think it's a country where Bin Laden uh, had a lot of support and a lot of operational base. Uh, I'm not going to go through the list, but the answer to your question is absolutely we have to do something, but not a general just net to everybody because they are followers of Islam or they are called Muslims, because some of these people are our closest allies and we need them in the fight against terrorism. Uh, and uh, therefore, we shouldn't alienate, uh, we shouldn't get our friends and allies mad, we should bring them to the fold and work with them to identify the bad guys. And the bad guys, we know exactly where they are operating and where they are centered. So I'm going around, I'm going back to Chinook. Uh, you guys look a bit too relaxed. <laughs> I want you to ask some questions from me. Uh, go ahead, please. Taking a water break. Yes, yes, sir. Do you believe that Iran is only going to use its nuclear policy for nuclear energy? Um, uh, great question. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was asked this question a few weeks ago. I was giving a talk. Um, this. Um, uh, this is a this is, this uh, actually question hits the nail on the head. Can we trust them? Uh, do, should we negotiate with them? So on and so forth. So the answer to the question: Should we negotiate? Of course, we should negotiate. Uh, but how much can we trust uh, the Iranian government? The majority of the Iranian people, uh, and this is a well-known fact. I think any American policymaker in Washington will tell you, the overwhelming majority of people, are very uh, Iranian people, are very pro-American in their attitude. So today even, in CNN, with all its kind of negative images, they couldn't uh, deny, they said, everybody you speak on the streets of Tehran, the capital city of Iran. And this is a large part of the country. The capital city has a population of nearly 12 million people. So, and he said, every person you talk on the streets of Tehran, they want a good relationship with the U.S. And you know why? Because uh, before the revolution of 79, every Iranian wanted to send their kids to university in the U.S. There were about 80,000 Iranian students going to school uh, in the United States. They want that relationship for their own selfish reasons. They want to uh, come to the United States. They want to visit friends and family. There are over a million Iranian Americans living in this country. A lot of these people have friends and family back in Iran, and they want this relationship to become normal, but also send their kids to universities in the United States. So the Iranian people want it, and I think they have been pressuring their government. And I think what we have done, and this is very interesting, this started late President uh, George W. Bush, and then with uh, uh, the present, the current administration, President Obama, we actually put some sanctions on Iran uh, to squeeze the government of Iran, to force them to
to come to the negotiation, and it worked. Uh, the economy was suffering from high uh, unemployment. Iran right now has over 6 million people unemployed. For a population of 75 million, that's a huge number. The inflation, though they will not say it officially, the official numbers are about 36, 37 percent, which is quite high. Uh, the black market inflation, where you want to get some good luxury, uh, so the products and goods, it's about 800 percent because imports are very expensive. And I give you an indication, you guys will appreciate this. Uh, the last time I was in Iran, the Iranian currency is real, right? But they call it Tuman in, in, in uh, street uh, language. They call it Tuman or Tuman. Uh, the Iranian Tuman to a dollar, if you had one dollar, you would exchange it with seven Tuman, one to seven. Right now, as we speak, one dollar is 3,500 Tuman. Look what has happened. The Iranian currency has completely lost its value. So there are economic reasons, there are financial reasons that they are negotiating with with the United States. I, sh I think that the, the, the negotiations should continue. But remember the Iranian regime, the Iranian government wants to ultimately have nuclear capability, not only for civilian use, but also for military use. And the reason, the way they put it, are twofold. And I want to share with all of you to sort of appreciate how they see it. One, they say India has it, Pakistan has it, Israel has it. Why can't us, the ancient Persians, you know, who have been here, who have had an empire, have this? And when you say, well, that's a threat, United States will not tolerate this, Israel will not tolerate this. The response is, you must be joking. If we have one, uh, one bomb or one or two or three, Israel has over a hundred and they can pulverize us. This is not a match. So you ask the second question, why are you insisting to have this eventually, a militarized capability or a nuclear bomb? And they say, look, who invaded Iran back in 1980, 1980? 1980. Who invaded Iran? Can, can somebody tell me? Eureka, Darby, Chinook, can anybody tell me? Who invaded Iran? Right. Uh, who invaded yeah. Iran? The answer was yeah. Iraq. Iraq. Yes, correct. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein of Iraq. <laughs> Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded Iran and for eight years the two sides fought, right? and over one million people were killed. When you ask the Iranians, they say, if we had the bomb, Saddam would have never dared to attack us. The bomb is not for attacking anyone, it's for defensive purposes. That's how they put it to their own population, and it makes a lot of sense. And lastly, and this is very important for us to remember, this is very, very important. Uh, remember uh, previous administration, President Bush, uh, talked about the axis of evil. In that axis of evil, there was North Korea, there was Iraq of Saddam Hussein, and there was Iran. And Iranians always say, who did United States attack? It was Iraq of Saddam Hussein. Who didn't United States attack? It was North Korea. Why? The difference was North Korea had nuclear capability and Iraq did not. So if we have the nuclear capability, Nobody will mess with us, right? We'll think about attacking us. So it's a defensive posture. It's not an offensive thing. I'm just sharing what I'm reading in the newspapers in terms of their point of view. But can we trust? Trust can only be established by action. So far, so good. They are actually delaying the development of the centrifuges and so on and so forth. But this is going to be an ongoing process, making sure that they are implementing what they are talking about. To just say, oh, suddenly a good guy has appeared, and we like his beard, and he, we look like, we like his smile, and therefore he's a better guy than this last guy who was mean. That's not how you run your diplomacy. It should be based on trust-building measures 
and I hope that it will continue for the sake of friendship and collaboration between the two countries. So, I'm going to go back to Eureka. Yes, please. What is your name, Eureka? My name is Don Smith. Don, very nice and meeting you. I was <laughs> yeah. Nice meeting you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, how do Takiya and Kitman influence business and political negotiations with, uh, with Islam in the West? Yeah. How did the first part of it? Can, can you repeat the first the, part? The first part of it kind of lost in the transition with the, the, the machine doesn't do that great of a job with audio so if you could repeat it yeah yeah all right, Go ahead. All right. how do how do Takiya and Kidman influence business and political negotiations with Islam and the West yeah uh, so tell me uh, yeah no I, I heard it I heard it and you're fine uh, yeah uh, you said Kidman who is Kidman it's a Quranic uh, uh, permission. Oh yeah, Ketman. Oh, I see. I see. Yes, yes, yes. I I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great question. Uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, I I think. Let me sort of give a broader, and then I come to more precise. Uh, I think, in a broader sense, when we deal with the Islamic world. We are not dealing with people uh, who are negotiating with us through their religion, right? By referring to their holy book and so on and so forth. They are negotiating from uh, their own national interest point of view. And, uh, you know, uh, when you think about, I'll just give you a kind of a, uh, as I'm answering your question, um, I am giving you an example. We just talked about Iran. So Iran has two neighbors to the north of Iran, right? And they're fighting, or they have been fighting. One country, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about it, Armenia, right? It's, it's a very old country. It's right north of Iran. The other one, a bit hard to pronounce, is called Azerbaijan, right? It's an Islamic country. It was very close to Iran for hundreds of years and so on and so forth. So... Armenians are Christians, Azerbaijanis are Muslims, and they, are, they have been fighting each other. And I ask you, who do you think uh, 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 Iran has sided with? Anybody would say Iran would side with Azeris or Azerbaijanis, because they are both Muslims. But in reality, Iran has been supporting Armenians, who are the Christians. And people say, oh my God, this is... The, the government in Iran is called the Islamic Republic of Iran. It must be Islamic, it must be based on the teachings of the Quran. Look, the reality is that the Iranian regime, the Turkish regime, which claims to be also Islamic, the Jordanians, the Saudis, who also claim to be very Islamic, they don't care about Islam when it comes to diplomacy, when it comes to negotiating with the United States or Europe. They care about their national interests. They care about self-preservation. And it's all about self-interest, national interest, and, and self-preservation. So if they use Islam, I, I hate to say it very openly and very bluntly, they are just pretending to be Islamic. In foreign policy, they're all about their own national interest or what they perceive to be their national interest. And that's one of the things we have to remember. Now, the, how much they actually use these concepts, Ketman and, you know, the Islamic concepts and so on and so forth, it is non-existent in their mindset. They might use it as a justification for imprisoning somebody, for, uh, you know, propaganda, so on and so forth. But in reality, it has no place in their mindset when they are operating in the real world. So I'm going to go back to Darby now. Darby, you guys, anybody? Okay, my question is, while you're studying in Iran, what is the most interesting experience you had? 
<laughs> That's a great question. And you know, it's gonna take weeks for me because I have so many, I've had so many interesting uh, experiences that um, one can write a book. And there are friends who have been pushing me lately to actually write maybe a, a, a collection of memoirs or stories or anecdotes from, from Iran. Uh, I think uh, um, one of the things that uh, uh, I came to appreciate is a sense of incredible uh, friendliness, incredible hospitality of all peoples in the region. Uh, you go there, you go, I, I mean, it's, it, I've experienced the same thing in Israel, I've experienced the same thing in uh, Turkey, I've experienced the same thing in Iran, uh, the sense of hospitality, so on and so forth. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, one thing that is also very interesting is uh, that uh, they make a separation between Americans as a people and the U.S. government. So when they're talking to you know, you guys go and you are shopping, they never equate you. They never say, oh, you guys are, you know, the ones who support President Bush or Obama. They make a complete separation. Americans are Americans. Their government is, is, an, is a government. But uh, there was a very interesting experience that I can share with you. And um, um, it was actually uh, during the revolution. Uh, of 1979 and I was in the airport I was in the Iranian airport in Tehran and uh, everybody is trying to leave especially the foreigners and there were millions of foreigners working in Iran and they were all afraid for their safety and security and uh, this tells you the perception that uh, exists inside Iran and there is a gentleman behind me uh, young American, you can tell, you know, you know, an engineer maybe, an architect, you know, he was kind of professional guy, and very nervous because a lot of planes would try to land in Iran, and the airport uh, workers were on strike, and uh, they wouldn't go, uh, they wouldn't allow them to land. So, uh, uh, and I was there with a friend who was trying to get out of Iran, and we were there from six in the morning, and by then, by the time this story begins, it's noon, 12 o'clock. And in front of me, there are about six or seven Iranian students. And they had come to say goodbye to one of their friends who was going to UK, who was going to London, in fact, to study. So I'm just kind of uh, eavesdropping a little bit. You know, they're talking about how great London will be and they're cracking jokes. And meanwhile, the poor guy behind me, the American guy, is perspiring. He's getting more and more nervous. When is my flight coming? So these guys in front of me, the Iranian guys, they go to the restaurant, the airport restaurant. And, you I mean, some of you may know about this. Persian food is incredible. They bring an entire, uh, you know, tray of magnificent Persian food you know, rice and, uh, you know, beef and chicken. I mean, the scent of the food was amazing. And they, they are making sandwiches and so on, and they are eating. And as they are making these sandwiches and they are kind of sharing these sandwiches, uh, they start eating. And it's, it's the Persian, it's the Iranian tradition to always uh, offer the food. So they immediately turned to me and said, you look hungry, would you like some food? And Iranians would never take any money or anything. This is like a gift, you know, we have been standing here for hours, so we know each other a little bit. So I said, no, thank you, you know, I had a big breakfast and so on. And, so on. and then one of them said, um, uh, excuse me, but the guy behind you, the, uh, where is he from? <laughs> so I turned to the poor guy and I said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude, but they're asking where you're from. He said, oh, United States. I said, well, he's American. And he said, you know, he looks so nervous. Uh, here's a sandwich we want to offer him. <laughs> so uh, I, I said, they're insisting you should have a sandwich. And the American guy said, but I don't have any money. Of course, it's, it's kind of cross-cultural, right, in America. You know, nothing for free, you know, you have to. And 
And immediately the Iranians took it kind of person and said, no, 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 we are not asking, we are Iranians, you know, you are giving your gift, you know, it's a, it's a sandwich. So I took it and uh, I realized how hungry was, he was in uh, less than two minutes, he had gobbled the sandwich and he loved it and he said, thank you very much, thank you very much. And these guys, uh, uh, I, I don't think the people who offered the sandwich spoke any English, he said, that's okay, that's okay, you're welcome, you're welcome, in Persian. Uh, and then they turned to each other and they uh, just, as if it automatically said, what is a sandwich for all the oil that your U.S. oil companies have stolen in the last 25 years? And they just exploded into laughter. And the American fellow behind me says, what are they laughing about? He said, I said, you know, I cannot translate that now. from." Her. So I said, they just are very happy that you took the sandwich and you liked it. So, oh, tell them thank you. And so, so I'm in the middle of all this. So what they were referring to 25 years ago is very interesting. They have maintained their friendliness. They want to be friendly, but they have not forgotten their history. 25 years before 1979, Iran had a democratic government. We, uh, uh, if we, we look at the history, there was a democratically elected government, very democratic. His name was Dr. Mossadegh, and his uh, problem was actually with the British. He took over Iranian oil industry. He actually allowed the Iranians to control their own oil and took it from the British. And initially, our government, the U.S. government, under President Truman, supported the Iranians. And they relied heavily on U.S. support to take over their own oil industry. However, later, when the British came back and offered us a share in Iranian oil, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, joined the British MI6 and they overthrew the government, the democratically elected government of Dr. Mossadegh. And Iranians have never forgotten that. 1953, August of 19 that that was the betrayal of a friendship between Iranians and Americans who trusted each other. So since then, they believe that their oil had been stolen by U.S. British oil companies. And that's what they were referring to. Now for me to translate that, but these are the cultural uh, crossings and misunderstandings sometimes that you face. But again, I go back, the best thing uh, in that part of the world is the hospitality of the people, the kindness, great food, great geography, great surrounding. And again, if you feel secure in some of these countries, I would urge you to travel, especially after you graduate from your high schools. I think we're, we're almost yeah. out of time here. Um, Thank you so much, guys. Chinook, Darby, Eureka, I really appreciate your attention and your great questions. And I hope to see you in Missoula at the University of Montana. Thank you very much, guys. Thank yeah, you. Fine, so yeah, we'll do that. And I just want to let everybody know as well, um, if you have any questions that were not answered today, you can go ahead and send those to me, and I will forward them on to Dr. Kia. Um, to kind of keep this conversation going. So again, thank you so thank much, you much and thank you Eureka Darby and Chinook for joining us today. Have a wonderful weekend.